I usually try to include a material and then a modeling method. And this is going to be one of the cases where this is probably the biggest stretch of concrete and T-splines. T-splines is a modeling technique. Um, and one of the reasons is, is that concrete is right now uh, coming out of favor and use in construction because of the heavy footprint uh, of um, CO2 gas that it emits during its production. So um, a lot of this presentation is going to be uh, somewhat negative about the use of concrete, uh, but we will spend a, a few, few, time, a few um, case studies, should I say, um, looking at some beautiful examples of concrete construction. So I don't want to limit your vision on this, um, but contemporary talk about the use of concrete is um, undergoing a transformation right now. So before we get started, I always, um, um, this is a structures course, and um, it, I'm always uh, amazed at the failure of modern uh, architectural projects sometimes. Um, actually, to humble us, uh, uh, the uh, best laid plans of, of great engineers. In this case, um, this was in 2019, um, a year ago, um, a pedestrian bridge between a college and university um, and it was uh, preformed um, next to the site to reduce the disruption of traffic. And then one day it was, um, you know, would be hoisted into place and then um, some additional structure would be added to it. And the story uh, basically goes, and, it, and this is hyperlinked um, so you can go to it, uh, but there were noted some structural or some cracks in the concrete. Um, and there were um, a host of errors that went along with this. One was the idea of prefabricating it and then putting it in place um, without the total structure that it was designed to have supporting it. Anyway, it was a great tragedy. It fell down before it was completed and killed six people. So a reminder of the serious nature of the things we build. On a less intense note, um, warnings about the things we build or cautions to make us better designers, more aware. This is a um, uh, mixed-use development going in on Elmwood Avenue in downtown Buffalo, and one of the day, one day I you know, run by this every day, and I noted that um, they started to apply the uh, this foam insulation on top of another moisture air barrier, and it really surprised me and made me start to think about what was going on here, um, especially because they were sealing the joints here between these, and um, I'm not going to make a definitive analysis of this, but I would point out some of the problems with the concept going on here. We have a, um, a barrier layer and a barrier layer on top of it. Um, and then the possibility, which is what we've really learned in rain screen systems, that all systems have points of failure where moisture can get in. And because these two are touching each other, there's a great ability for capillary action to take over. And I'm sure the argument um, by the designers of the facade was that no moisture will get back there because this is sealed and if it does, it can't get through the building because this is sealed. And, and I think that's the primary way that we see these failures in rain screen systems, or excuse me, failures in wall systems, and why this constant reminder about the value of rain screen concepts and construction is so important. So if we look at a couple of other images of this installation, you'll notice that the, um, in further weatherproofing or um, barrier systems that were going up, you can see all the damage um, around that isn't being dealt with in any meaningful way. You can even see the, the uh, tape being um, coming off. And there were attempts to cover areas that were exposed. Um, but in other cases, uh, a lot of the installation is going along with very little um, uh, attention to this kind of detail. So I leave it to you thinking about the when you're designing your your your, your moisture barrier systems, your high performing walls, um, to think about not only what you're designing but also how it will end up being installed and what potential problems could come from that. So let's take a few minutes um, really to talk about um, innovation in concrete and this is really based on um, much of it on the reduction in the use of concrete. This is a, a hyperlink to a web page, and they'll talk about it being the second use, you know, second most material used on Earth, um, and it's the second largest CO2 emitter, um, accounting to five percent, five to seven percent of annual emissions. So um, there's a, a heavy movement on, obviously, in architecture to reduce carbon footprint of our built forms because we use so much energy, and um, 
this article goes through, and I would invite you to read it, um, two ways that people are looking to mitigate, well, a couple of things. One is the in the manufacture of concrete, how much CO, CO gases has to be admitted. And a lot can be done with the idea of amending the concrete um, uh, to make it lighter, um, uh, adding structural elements to it, like fibers, in some cases, natural fibers, um, thinning down the structure, and using advanced printing techniques, 3D printing techniques to create um, forms that are by the nature of their form um, inherently structural. Um, so there's all kinds of research on that on that front. Um, you know, even the idea of, of glass reinforced um, concrete, glass fiber reinforced concrete panel systems, still giving the idea of massive elements, but very lightweight panels being fabricated from that. And this is a video, um, it's worth watching because it's, it touches on a couple of different dimensions about the advancements in the state of the art. This is a fabric woven shape that was erected and then um, concrete was applied. So the, the actual fabric itself is part of the formwork of its creation. Uh, so here we have the, the mesh analysis of the form. Um, it almost happened so fast. Let's go back to that. I'll just pause that for just a minute, if I can. Um, so here we have um, this laid out for the knitting machine. And this is the um, order of the printing of the fabric sections uh, to create that shape. So they un unwrapped it and laid it out into a, um, a manufacturable component something that we are learning how to do in our current course. I guess one of the unique things about this is the idea that this form work is actually just rolled up. There, I believe there's an image of them transporting it across the country in suitcases. So the idea that it's, it can be moved uh, very easily. Obviously there's a lot going on in these types of systems. So while we see the lightweight formwork um, of the fabric, we still have all of this kind of other structure to hold that frame up. Um, so he, um, obviously there's all kinds of analysis issues about whether we're actually saving materials. But once again, very unique about how much tension is put on it. I guess one of the questions would be, why do we need to make it a concrete item, except that it makes it completely self-standing and rigid? And there they are, and they apply a couple of coats of different materials. And so that's the, I guess, uh, the bleeding edge of technology in the formation of complex concrete structures. So we'll go back to our, I'll just stop this from playing. And um, there's a few other things here. Obviously, these are well worth watching. Um, this is a floor system, um, and the idea here of, of removing um, by using um, um, finite element analysis and regenerative design to remove the concrete that's not needed in a floor deck um, in areas and where the structure is needed to um, provide the concrete so that we have a, a lightweight, high-performing surface. And I think that concludes that amount of presentation. So uh, keep it in mind that I guess the overall um, feeling in the industry today is to is a, really a discouragement over the use of concrete. Um, and keeping that in mind, um, we still want to achieve uh, beautiful um, architecture. So this is a, a kind of a compare and contrast about alternatives. Um, so here we have uh, Saarinen's um, TWA building, beautiful uh, thin shell concrete building. Um, you could say it's really actually a very efficient use of concrete also. So I don't mean to make that a dig on um, this is a concrete structure. Uh, but here is the National Air and Space Museum, um, an entry canopy system, obviously um, almost a complete duplicate of the Saarinen TWA building. But I'm showing you this, just the idea of we can still create great forms and use different kinds of materiality. and um, Obviously, there's um, some downsides to that, the exposure of this framework, but 
it could be conceived that there is fabric supplied to both the exterior or cladding systems and the interior. And um, obviously just moving towards engineering these things to being both um, high performing, beautiful, and uh, reducing our carbon footprint in the way we choose to utilize materials. Calatrava's uh, work is also, um, um, I think, really strongly influenced by CERN. And I, I, this was the idea of expressing concrete, these mass systems. And I couldn't help but see the similarities in um, looking at this project and then um, uh, his work and how um, even great architects um, uh, take the lessons of other great architects. So I see um, so much here that uh, to me personally, I would have felt like I was using, lifting the actual work from another. And that may be clearly expressed and admitted, um, but nonetheless, it's to me, I, I took it as a lesson about what, pe what even great people use as inspirations for their ideas. And here's the, um, his work in the, um, I guess, the ground zero area of New York City and a transit um, hub, a um, major and beautiful structure created there. Um, we can dig in just a little bit into the TWA. I think one of the reasons I wanted to spend just a few more minutes with this is um, the complexities of the shape and the humbling of how um, these were done prior to computers and advanced modeling techniques. This is a good shot because it also kind of communicates how thin that shell is of the building. So we have um, these built up edges, but we can see that the, 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 the overall thickness of these um, systems is really quite thin. And here it is under construction. This is back in the 50s, early 50s, I believe. Just a beautiful shot of this thin, lightweight um, shell system. This is uh, an important image um, to think about because of the, uh, you can see the massive amount of formwork and structure that's needed to create um, this type of a shape. Because you have to pour a liquid material and wait for it to harden, you have to have some way of structurally supporting that um, through that transition. Just a close-up shot of these um, shells coming down to their load-bearing points and this natural, um, uh, what appears to be natural and well thought out transition of these loads um, to foundation systems. You can still uh, see uh, the amount of rebar laying around uh, for future work of reinforcing all of this concrete that's being constructed. So this has been um, recently restored and so it's a, it's a really popular project. Um, and uh, it really has always looked pretty good as far as um, my appear the appearances of it when I've been at that airport. Um, but this is some look back at the um, some of the original construction of it. So you can see a lot of the um, you can see the wood formwork um, that created these shapes. Once again, I, I I'm really quite impressed with the idea of the, the the thin shell shapes here. Obviously, you can see how they're working to create drainage and um, pushing up at the ends to create um, a, a more attractive form from grade level. And I, I think a lot of this work was done, um, and I don't have all of the, you know, obviously the, uh, I haven't done a significant amount of research on this project, but the idea of the, um, um, the shapes and forms really being generated in, in model type methods and then um, translated back to drawings. So we have, here we have a whole, um, just a great shot of a model room at that time and the, um, the experimentation of roof systems, the, um, you know, the construction of these very thin shells, the idea of looking at how, how you would transition your grid systems to it. This is actually a contemporary picture of the um, renovated um, facility. And this is a historical one, so it really retains a lot of its original integrity. What's uh, also, to me, uh, noteworthy is this: um, these bow trusses that are supporting the glazing systems. They look really uh, very advanced for 50s design, um, and really create a very um, thin, lightweight kind of glazing system. Um, and we'll we'll look at glass in, in the future in this course. So I think it's really important to note how advanced um, this glazing system was for its time. Um, and Hadid's work um, is kind of, uh, I put this here to, to kind of say, how would we build it today? 
And instead of it being um, a mass of concrete with reinforcement in it, we're now starting to look at using uh, grid systems, space frames, in order to create the uh, underlying superstructure. And there's some inherent advantages to that. It is actually, um, um, we don't need to create scaffolding to support the structures because they self-support as we uh, put them together like tinker toys. So there are all kinds, a host of um, efficiencies that are gathered on site during the construction of these complex shapes. There is on Blackboard a link to the construction of the Sydney Opera House, which is where we're going to go next. Another thin shell kind of, well, this is actually not a thin shell. It appears as a thin shell uh, concrete um, structure. And obviously, that's a great compare and contrast because the, as you'll see as we get into, the, the, uh, into this, the, these shells are now very thick and massive. And here's a cutaway of the uh, building. And actually, they don't do anything to disguise this kind of idea of massing. This isn't really as thick as those sections are, but you'll see how much material is involved in that. Because they are constructed of these rib systems. Um, uh, obviously, what's, what's so neat about looking at um, the Sydney Opera House for me is um, someone who's involved in um, instructing um, computational design is how similar this looks to the things we're doing today as far as panelizing systems, um, the way the forms are all changing as they move along a surface, but they still are the same component basically. Uh, but in this case, this is a lot of structural concrete that went into this project, um, possibly uh, way over-engineered. I think there was a, a huge concern because they, there's very little familiarity with designing these forms. There's a story of having uh, started the foundations and then having to remove them because once they had engineered the shells, the weight that was bearing on them um, exceeded what they were designed for, so they had to be reconstructed. So here we have an interior view of those ribs coming up. You can see how deep they are. And also um, what a beautiful form this creates on the interior of the building. Still a massive use of concrete. So uh, back in, in those days, um, they didn't have the advantage of computational um, algorithms and computers to do all of the calculations. If they did, they would do them manually and that would become exhaustive and impossible. Um, uh, as, as far as the amount of man hours required. Uh, in the video, you'll see some discussions about how they came up with these final forms, the simplicities of them in order to make them mass producible. Um, I see this image and I think a lot about boat building. I'm sure that people brought the technologies that they knew with hull design. This is a, a concept called lofting, where you uh, take the geometry and shape at a certain point and you pull it off and uh, you can generate through two-dimensional drawings, um, three-dimensional curvilinear shape. And this is it now being transferred. In this case, the lofting happens out onto sheets of plywood where actual members are then literally fabricated from that. Another great reason to look at the video is just this discussion about how much testing went into it and the manual kind of, of verification of calculations. So here we're actually uh, loading um, models of the shell with weights. Here's the bottom side of that weights hanging down in order to verify what calculations they did. And, and there is mention that computers were used, but they were in their infancy. So the kind of calculations and sophisticated sophistication is much different than we have today. Um, these were precast and then hoist into place. So this gives you an idea of the human scale of them. So once again, we see that kind of diagonal bracing, not unlike what we think about in doing space frame construction. And this is a great, this is a great image of the underlying structure and then the cladding system. And I think the cladding system um, really holds up today as far as its beauty and interest. Um, this, I want to say chevron for lack of a better word, uh, patterning. And then up close, um, the idea that these are covered with ceramic tile the glazed contrasting with the unglazed tiles, creating this really delightful, beautiful, sophisticated uh, look to the surface. So that completes um, lo the look at the Sydney Opera House. Um, I guess one of the, the last things I wanted to really kind of um, discuss is some of the, I guess, 
the stretch of the absurdity or, or I, I hate to use the term absurdity, but the, the stretch in where we're going, maybe a pun intended because we're looking at fabrics, of what our, our advanced thinking is on the construction of these forms. So here's a thin shell form. Obviously, again, once again, uh, supposedly done without form work. Um, I think it's really neat to look at the facility that this is being done in. This is like a college, a technical college or uh, European research group where we have these um, all kinds of automated advanced um, computers um, driving um, robot arms on gantry systems. Um, really sophisticated cutting edge uh, type of uh, research and facility. So the idea here was they were to build a um, a thin shell structure in an innovative way. And once again, you can see it being pulled apart here. So we have substructures, we have a cable net grid system, we have um, a fiber system, um, on, or excuse me, this might be a fabric barrier, then a fiber reinforcement, and then finally a concrete shell to it. And if we roll back here underneath the words, we can see a lot of this up oh, disappeared so quickly, I'm sorry. You see all of this still underlying structural systems to hold everything up in place. There we go, it labels it for us. I'm really amazed at the this really fancy looking connector systems. I think to think that they're all buried in concrete seems such a um, a waste of that beauty of that complexity. So here they are laying up that mesh. Um, it looks like this. Just we can stop here. Um, it, this looks like a Rhino um, building environment. So just as an idea of what software is being used, this is this is for sure Rhino. And then they are putting the coding systems on it. And I think the plastic sheet is to control the curing time of the of the uh, concrete that gets applied to it. And it looks like they pull down that cable system then once they're done. So maybe those are reusable components. So this may, may be where the future of thin shell concrete systems goes. Um, it's up to the future to find that out. So that pretty well covers just a brief, I guess, um, stimulation on the idea of concrete. Um, what I really want to do now is think about where we will go with the idea of T-splines. So in, in just to back up a little bit, one of my thoughts um, for linking T-splines with concrete um, was in the project that we're going to work on where um, T-splines lend themselves to this monolithic or monochromatic surface. And I thought it would be a good way to look at these thin shell materials or concretes as a way of producing these. Um, but it's it also is kind of a reach. So these don't necessarily have to be made out of conceived and or made out of concrete. Um, so a little bit on T-splines. And one of the reasons why I want you to experience T-splines is the, they offer a unique way of thinking about creating modeling forms. They come from, this is um, a link to Autodesk. And they come to, to us from an industry, um, an Autodesk level of product design, where they needed to create these really complex curved shapes, and they needed um, uh, easy ways to define those. Um, and also, Grasshopper is really advanced, or excuse me, Rhino is very advanced in the concepts of, of uh, T-splining. Um, just a brief idea about it, a T-spline, kind of like a three-dimensional NURBS um, curve. We have a control point, and then the shape is generated from that. It really reduces the complexities of the shape, of the definition of the shape, and really um, empowers the modeler um, with the tools they need to create um, really fast and um, high-quality surfaces. So this is a student. Um, I'll just run through this 
um, who's using T-spline uh, concepts to create a shape form of uh, an existing building to show how it would be done. So um, you can go, uh, it always starts in the wrong spot. I'm already in the middle of things there. But the idea here is we're, she's using the image to then come up with these basic um, forms that are created in Rhino. So this is really a, quite a nice tutorial. And then uh, working with those, extruding them up and starting to work with those in three-dimensional geometry. And kind of the beauty of the system is when we get to this idea of what you can do um, to manipulate these forms very quickly. And that squaring of it is just a like a, pr a cruder preview before it goes to a higher resolution uh, rendering of the form. So they're just she's just um, showing how to close how she can close up those forms, and then you can see where it pops back to a T-spline surface. And I'll need to pause that so that it's not running while well. I go back to our slideshow. And so uh, Autodesk um, is also, like I said, trying to introduce these T-spline, but it's coming from their product development end. And for that reason, uh, the implementations inside of Revit are rather crude, uh, of both Dynamo and Revit are relatively crude at this point. Um, just a little visual description of the power of T-splining. So here we have this idea of pipes. And then we can define the way those pipes come together in order to create these um, nice smooth transitions. And we can create different value systems for them to really um, significantly alter their appearance. There are a couple of companies um, that are using those technologies in different ways, but they're still kind of a related to me um, to our um, architectural endeavors. So here's a company that's really advanced nervous systems. If I click to their site, I need to go to generative design area and I might need to find a custom custom place to create this here. Let's try the custom ring. So here we're popped into a modeling environment where we can actually make adjustments to these systems. And I'm not exactly sure how all of these happen, but let's say we'll change the, the, um, the shape to a sculpture and we'll hit build it. And we can adjust the kind of structure that goes along with it in real time. And then I believe we can just touch these points and um, divide them up further. So we have a lot of ideas about the way we can control um, the twist, inside outside twist, the shape. So just a, to me, a very fascinating look at what um, I think the basis is that same idea of T-splining. Um, to create these really um, very complex and visually interesting surfaces. And this is happening in real time inside of a browser, which makes it to me all the more um, remarkable. And then at the real stretch of where we're going with complex surface creations, I thought this was a good place to put this in. This is um, Neri Oxman at MIT. And um, they have created a robot and then mass produced that robot as a manufacturing machine. It contains a, a ribbon fiber and it can weave its own structure as it climbs up through it. The group is called the Mediated Matter Group. So this is the construction parts. You can see it in operation, the idea of how it, how it um, weaves as it progresses up and then probably when it's done doing a certain section it works its way up the up the there we go it works its way up the construction and then a little bit of tilting will allow it to create uh, direct its form in any direction so these are obviously really far out advanced ideas about architectural and or artistic construction systems
So um, that's at the far out, and now maybe to bring it back down to earth, these are 3D printed um, um, shapes that are applied as a second facade to a building. And I think it's um, more in the realm of uh, something that we could um, conceive of and include in our project. And this is obviously very similar to what you'll be doing if you do the T-spline project. So um, that concludes our our really brief discussion of concrete and T-splines.